Thank you. Let's continue our study with one another. Let's go to God in prayer before we get into it. Let's bow our heads. Our holy Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. As your people, we rejoice that we're able to come together and think about you, think about your nature, think about your blessings, think about the need to be obedient to you and the need to be pleasing to you. And all that comes when we are pleasing to you, we thank you. We thank you so much. We pray that you'll bless us now as we, would op as we open up your word. Help us to take your word seriously, to reflect upon it, to think about it through the course of the day. Bless us, we ask in your son's name. Amen. Will you open your Bibles now to 2 Samuel chapter 7? 2 Samuel chapter 7. You don't have to open your Bibles over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I will. I want to read a, a passage to you, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But keep your hand there in 2 Samuel 7 because we'll get there in just a moment. That's where we're really going to sit on and, and try to get some information from. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 9, the Apostle Paul said this. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please God. I want you to think about that. Paul said, regardless of whether we are at home or we are also people who are not at home, and there he's talking about where, whether we're at home with God or whether we're here, our whole purpose is to please God. Well, that's a challenging idea, isn't it? And can you really say that your whole purpose is to please God? And I get that maybe that's a lifelong journey. I get that maybe sometimes we want to please him, but we've got to grow. I don't know if you guys have the song in your song book, uh, but it's, um, it's um, all of, um, none of self and all of thee. You know, there's a progression. It's all me and none of you. Then it's maybe a little less me and a little more of you. Then it's a lot more of you, but still a little me. me and it, it ends with none of self and all of thee. Well, that's that's the way our life is in a lot of ways, and we need to understand that. We're all growing, but as we grow, our purpose needs to be to please God, which then brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 7. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David, the great king of Israel, his kingdom was coming together really, really well. In verse 1, we find, Now when the king lived in his house... And the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But the same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've moved about in a tent for my dwelling. Verse 7 is really important. In all places where I've moved with all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word from any of the judges of Israel who I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? I want you to notice God's point there. David wanted to honor God. And God said, in this plan that you have, paraphrased, when did I ever tell you that's what I wanted? And if you go through the rest of the chapter, what God says is, you're not going to build me a house. You cannot. Your son will, but I'm going to bless you. So it, it ends really well. But you do need to notice the statement in verse 7 where God said, when did I tell you that's what I wanted? I want us to think about that for a little while. You need to hear about how to please God. We talked about in the last hour God being this holy being. It's all wonderful. He blesses. He, he takes care of us. 
Those of us who are Christians, we understand that one day he wants us in heaven with him. How incredible is that? And yet we closed on somewhat of a downer, and that is this holy God is a God that you've got to be careful with. You don't just come before God without a lot of thought. Leviticus 10, by those who come before me, I will be sanctified. And I tried to make the point, I may have been rushing a little bit to get through with the lesson. This is not that God is saying, you've got to make sure you honor me and you've got to make sure you treat me because you're going to hurt my feelings and otherwise I won't bless you. But it's compositionally because of who God is. Because of God's very nature, God is separated from us. And God is saying, you've got to be careful around me because I am perfect and I'm holy and you can't handle that. And I made the, the analogy with electricity, which I think is a really good analogy because we all understand that. It's not that electricity makes the decision, oh, you didn't handle me right, I'm gonna shock you. It's because of what it is, it has to be respected. And, and that's what I think we see when we talk about God. Because of who God is, you've gotta be careful. You've got to come before him with great care. Which brings up the question, then, well, how do we do it? How, how do I honor this God? How do I approach this God? How do I handle him carefully? And I want you to begin with this idea. And this is the good news. God wants to be pleased. Right? It's a great place to start, right? That this being who wants to bless us, he does, he does make it possible that you can live in a way that pleases him. You can live in such a way that you receive his blessing. The creator of the universe made you to relate to him. It's one of the first things we learn in Genesis chapter 1. God made us in his image. You know what that's telling you? God made us to relate to him. God wants a relationship with you, and he wants a relationship with me. In Acts 17, as Paul is preaching on Mars Hill in Athens, Paul said, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, that they should seek him and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he's actually not far from each one of us. Notice that phrase, God wants you to seek him. Regardless of who you are, what you've done in your life, how unholy you have been. <clears throat> you need to know God wants you to seek him. And implied within that is God wants you to find him. God wants a relationship with you. God wants to hear from you. You are important to God. You're not the most important thing ever, but you're important to God. God is not indifferent when it comes to you. And a lot of times we feel like, oh, well, God doesn't want me because I've done this and I've done that and I've messed my life up. That's all bogus. God wants you. God's aware of everything you've done, every fault that you have. <coughs> God loves you. And he hates what sin has done to you. And that's an important part of it because sin in Genesis chapter 3 came into the picture and it disrupted this relationship with God. God made man in his image. And there was, it seems, in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, this union there, this harmony where God walked in the garden and humanity was there. And there was a deep and intimate fellowship and sin came along and that ended. And you remember what happens at the end of chapter 3. God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden. And that fellowship is disrupted, but you need to understand it didn't destroy. Sin didn't destroy that fellowship. And what happens in chapter 4 is, in chapter 4, we have this sacrifice that's offered by Cain and Abel. And you know that story. But where did that come from? Well, the implication from the Hebrew writer, faith is something that we learn is that there was some instruction by God. And that's the first real step. Well, actually, it's the second step. The first step was when man fell, God said, look, to the serpent, I'm going to fix this one day. 
And there will be a seed of woman that will come and undo all of this. But what happens in chapter four is God begins to give instruction to humanity. Man has been separated, but God doesn't want you to be separated. He didn't want man to be separated. So these instructions, this is the way you come before me. This is the way that you approach me. The psalmist said in Psalm 78 verse 5, he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children. And the whole point of that verse is God has told humanity, this is how you come to me. And that's through law. It's through law, teaching, instruction. This is the way you do this. I want you to be here. I want you to come to me. You got to do this carefully. I will tell you how. I'll tell you how to come. So God gave these instructions so that they could come and follow him. And these instructions were always good. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through 13. Moses wrote, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, which I'm commanding you today for your good. God says, I want you here. I need you here. I will instruct you. This is the way to approach me. And when you approach me this way, it will be good for you. You need to understand that when God gave his law, Old Testament or the New Testament, he gave it so that we could benefit from it. I know, I know a lot of times you, you feel restricted by God's law. Why can't I go out and get drunk? Why can't I go out and, and hang out with my friends? And why can't I use drugs? And why can't I be with my girlfriend? Because we're really close right now. And I really think things can move in a direction. Why, why, why? God says, guys, I'm perfect. My instructions are perfect. I only want what's best for you. You need to listen to me. Because I want you with me. You need to understand that the only way any of this takes place, this is really important, is because of grace. If you look in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. When the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies, notice the Lord had given him rest. We're going to talk a lot about in this hour the idea of obeying God and how we obey him. But I, I need to lay this foundation. The only reason you and I can obey him is because he made the first step. And that's what grace is all about. This is not in any way to start suggesting that we work our way into heaven. But it is to say that we need to respond to God's grace. But it is God's grace first. You don't woo him. You don't cajole God. You don't have to sit back and try to say, okay, God, what do I need to do if I step over here? And God's going, I don't know. Maybe I need you to go a couple of steps farther. You, you don't approach God like that. God comes to us and he says, look, I want you. And I know you messed your life up with sin. I want to take care of that. That is 100% his grace, guys. God reaches out with his grace to us. And he says, I will provide the means by which you can approach me and you can find salvation. We don't deserve it. We cannot earn it anyway. And I want you to notice in verse 1, David responds in verse 2 because of the fact of verse 1. David looks at all that God had done for him and God, David wants to respond to that, but it's because God had given him rest. And that's what Ephesians 2 is all about, right? We were dead in our sin and our trespasses, but God, who is rich in mercy, reaches out to us through Jesus. By grace, you have been saved. Not of works, lest any of you should boast, this grace. So great question. How much grace do you need within your life? Okay, so you think, okay, so I grew up in the church. Pretty good kid. Messed up a couple of times along the way, but uh, not as much as other people have messed up. So I think I need maybe, maybe 20% um, grace. I think 80%, I nailed about 80% of that. Is that the way you look at it? And you think, well, okay, so God, yeah, God will give me 20% grace. Yeah, that's pretty good. How about 30% grace? What if you did pretty good 70% of the time? You go, oh, yeah, I think God would give you 30% grace. You go, how about 50% grace? 
Well, that's a little more tricky now because that means you've been blowing it half the time. But, you know, okay, maybe, maybe God would give you 50% grace. How about 60% grace? Ooh, hmm. I don't know about that. I mean, that's, that's asking a lot of God because you haven't been really doing very much here. How about 80% grace? No, 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 that's really not going to happen. You know what Paul said? You were dead in your trespasses. You know how, how much grace you need? Can I give you just a quick answer? 100%. 100%. And so part of God's grace is just giving the, us the opportunity and giving us, we may not think about this, but giving us instructions. That's part of God's grace. Sin came along in the garden and we walked away from God. But God's grace reaches out and he says, I want you to come to me. I'll give you instruction. For, so for us today, the instructions are the New Testament. Old Testament has value there. But our instructions on how to turn to God and please him, that's going to be found in the New Testament. But you need to understand that grace has expectations. Number one, two points. Number one. You can be pleasing to God. God wants you to come to him. Number two, grace, the means by which he does this, has expectations. First expectation, appreciation. Verse two again. <clears throat> oh, thank you very much. Verse two again. The king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the, house, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. You remember the tabernacle, this tent, and it moved all around. And David's looking and saying, wait a minute. I'm, I'm in this house of cedar. Look how nice my house is. And look how, how bad God's house is. And David wanted to build God a house. Now, if you didn't know the rest of the story, raise your hand if you think, you think, oh, that was a good thing for him to want to do. It's okay. Raise your hand. All of us. I see hands everywhere. Not really, but in my mind I do. Because <laughs> the, we'd all say, hey, great job, David. In fact, open your Bibles over to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Look at verse 18. 1 Kings chapter 8. Verse 18. These are instructions to Solomon on building the house. All right. Verse 18, but the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your house, in your heart. All right. That's an important thing right there. Maybe rather than condemning people all the time who we may not think are getting things right, maybe one of the things we should start doing is tell them, hey, you're doing well that you want to please God. Maybe that would be a good starting point. Because God did appreciate David's desire to appreciate God. Now, God's going to instruct him here and guide him. But, but you need to understand that if we really want to please God, it's going to begin with appreciation. If you don't appreciate God, you will not praise God. You will not worship him. You will come and sit in the building for a while, but that's as far as it's going to go. So some good self-reflection time right now would be spend... 30 seconds thinking about how much you appreciate God. Go. Okay, stop. And by the way, 30 seconds isn't a lot of time. But that's why you're here today. At least why you should be here. David wanted to show something to God to let God know how much he appreciated God. That's a great thing to do. It's a great thing to do. And it was so wonderful. Nathan, the prophet, said, Knock yourself out. This is, I think that's great. God will surely approve of that. Now we're going to see in a moment that God wanted to pull that back a little bit. But I want you to notice that pleasing God has to begin with appreciating him. 
It's not just fulfilling a duty. It's sitting back and thinking about what God has done for you and how he's blessed you. We will never fully seek to please God unless we are appreciative of him. Not mildly interested in God, but deeply, deeply appreciative. Jesus put it like this. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. God blesses us immensely And anything we could do for him will always pale in comparison to what he wants to do for you. You've got to understand that. But we should want to do something for him. You can please God. God wants to be pleased. If we're to please him, it needs needs to begin with a sense of appreciation for him. Grace ought to cause us to want to respond. But listen to this second thing. We need to make sure we listen to God. Notice with me beginning in verse 4 of 2 Samuel chapter 7. Verse 4. The same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, would you build me a house to dwell in? I've not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've been moved about in a tent from my dwelling. In all the places where I moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people of Israel saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? So God says, David, that's great. I appreciate you doing this, but here's the problem. I didn't tell you that's what I wanted. Ultimately, if we are to please God, we have to let him tell us how to do that. And then we have to be content with that. So years ago, as a preacher, uh, we would travel around quite a bit. We, when the girls were little, we were going someplace. I don't know if it's down to Mississippi to see my parents, maybe a meeting somewhere. We're going down the road and the girls say, Dad, can we get a Coke? at the next convenience store. So I say, sure. So I pull over and the girls want Dr. Pepper, Dr. Pepper, Coke. And I asked Teresa, I said, what would you like to drink? She says, water. Okay, water. So I go in, get the Dr. Peppers, get the Cokes, and I look at water. Well, guys, there are, there are a lot of different waters at convenience stores. It's not just water. You've got fruity waters and, um, and soda waters and all these different waters. And I'm looking at this, I'm thinking like, my wife deserves the best water they have. My wife didn't know they had all these different types of water. So I'm going to get her not just regular water. You know, anybody can drink regular water. This is for my wife. I'm going to get her good water. So I got her this sparkly water and I was really pleased with myself. And I sat down, I gave it to her and I, oh, you know, gave it to her and, and she's nice enough. She takes it and everything. And I'm just, I'm, we're driving down the road and I'm just, at some point, She's going to talk to me how, Mark, I'm so thankful you got this wonderful water for me. And we're going down the road and she says, Mark, I love you, but now if you're married, you know the conversation's not going to go well from that point. And she said, next time I ask for water, just get me some water. Okay. And I've always remembered that because because of my, my intense love for her, I wanted to do more. But the message she gave me was, I, I asked for what I asked for, and that's, that was what I wanted. Now, it's possible with my wife or with someone that you know and you interact with, it's possible for you to give them something that they're not aware of, you know, but it doesn't work like that with God. You can't surprise God. You can't say, God, you know, let's sort of jump into something we'll talk about in a few moments. God, we want to sing to you. We're going to bring instruments in. You didn't ask for that in the New Testament, but, you know, you didn't know we would have a big band today. You know, you'd, and God, you really think that's the way it works with God? God didn't know this? So this, this phrase that God uses with David, when did I tell you to do that? That has application in our life today. We can't surprise God. We can't give God something that he was unaware of. And what God told David is, David, you know, kudos to you for wanting to do this for me. First Kings chapter eight. But his message here is, I I didn't ask for that. And David, you're not going to give me that. You and I need to be people if we are to please God. We've got to make sure we listen to him. So how do we listen to him? Good question. How do we listen to him? Well, how do, we, how do we listen to other people? How do we communicate to other people? There are three primary ways that we do this, and all of us do this all the time with people. We tell people things. 
All right. We tell them facts about ourselves. We tell them something we want them to do. My wife said, I'd like for you to get me some water. That was a, a statement, a command. All right. We also look at examples of other people. I had three daughters, I have three daughters. Um, the oldest daughter does things, you know, who's watching the middle daughter, and the youngest daughter. And so they start doing the same thing and that, that works out well. And sometimes we, we imply things and, and they infer things. So like if a, a father is going to go uh, paint a wall and he paints the wall and he gives the brush to his son and says, clean this brush. There's more than just clean the, bl the brush. There is implied and the son should infer from that now, right? He's not saying, hey, clean this brush next week. It, it's, it's inferred. It's implied, and the son infers, you do it now, right? We do that all the time. We bring these into our relationship with the Lord, and sometimes people say, oh, that's all manufactured. I really want to emphasize here, that's the way we communicate with people all the time. Right? This, this, there's nothing inherently religious about what we're going to talk about next. We're just going to bring these principles that we all understand, and we're bringing them into our relationship with God. So, we need to listen to what God tells us to do. And this one is pretty easy. Um, it's not complicated. You can figure this one out pretty easily. John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus said, by your love for one another, all people know you're my disciples. Here's an easy one. You got to love one another. Well, we don't do that one sometimes, but that's a command, right? God says, you, you want to know what I want out of you? Love one another, right? Love one another. Or you could look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 25, where we take the Lord's Supper. All right. And we know that that's something we do on a regular basis because he said through the teachings of Paul, when you gather with one another, you do this. James chapter 1, visit widows and orphans. Take care of people who are in need. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, associate with one another on the first day of the week. Those are all things God says, this is what I want you to do. You want to please me? Do these things. And there are a lot of others, a lot of others. But also God shows us what to do. Open your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Notice the words of the Apostle Paul here. Be imitators, Paul said of me, as I am of Christ. You know what Paul is saying there? I want you to watch me and do what I do. Why? Because Paul would have received some instructions that we may not have these commands for. But Paul did. Right? So Paul said, you just do what I do. There is the assumption in this whole uh, concept here that when we see people acting in the first century, they were acting upon instructions. Okay, so let's go back to just an ordinary example. I tell my kid, Oldest kid, I want you to cut the grass. And this is where I want you to cut the grass. You got to be careful over here because we got a really, really crazy neighbor and they go nuts if you're over in their property a little bit. So you got to be careful here and I want you to do that. And then I want you to weed eat over here. I'm giving instructions to them. But the second kid and the third kid, they're watching the first kid and they're learning all these things. They're saying, oh, look, they're walking really careful over there and they're doing this. I didn't tell them, but they're learning. All right. And so God sometimes shows us because the Bible is a book of history. And we see stories and accounts of people who acted. A couple examples of this as we bring it into our relationship today. Open your Bible to Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And these are all passages that you know. I'm just reminding you of things that may be helpful to you. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Why do we take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week with one another? Well, when Paul and his traveling companions went to Troas, we find in verse 1, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked to them, intending to depart on the next day. He prolonged his speech until midnight. This is the text that tells me that that's when the early Christians met. Well, how do I know? That's what the text said. How did they know to do it? Presumably, they received instructions, but Paul's there. And when Paul is with them and they carry out this action, there we know that this is something that was appropriate. So 2,000 years later, as we wrestle with, well, we know we're supposed to take the Lord's Supper. Well, when do we take the Lord's Supper? We look at a passage like this and we see that's appropriate for us to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. The funds that we take up on the first day of the week, what do we do with those funds? 
Uh, do we like all go on a trip to, you know, Cancun, you know, with these funds with one another? What do we do with these funds? And we find example after example in scripture of how these funds were used. If you'll open your Bible to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, if you'd notice verses 25 and 26. Paul writes at present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints for Macedonia and Achaia have, get, have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. But one of the things we understand from the New Testament is these funds, the only example that we have of how these were used were to help out needy Christians. You say, what about other people? We not care about other people? No, we care about other people. But these funds are not to be used for other people. Who helps the other people? I help the other people. You help the other people. But that's not the purpose of the Lord's church, to help other people. We take care of one another. You say, well, it's pretty limiting. This is all I got, guys. This is it. Okay? And, and I can step away from that, but I don't know that it pleases the Lord. So let's just stick with what it says. And stick with the examples that we are given. You see the same thing, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Growing up, in my young mind, I always heard it's the collection of the saints. Until I started reading, and it's the collection for the saints. And then you can look in Philippians chapter 4, verses 15 through verse 16, where Paul talked about receiving funds from the Christians at Philippi. To preach the gospel. And so there we know that it's appropriate to support those who are pre the, preaching the gospel. You see where we're going here? I mean, all it goes back to this book and the instructions that we are given. If we are to please God, we listen to what he tells us. We listen to what he shows us. And yeah, the trickier one, we listen to what he infers. Open your Bibles, Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, I want to look at two passages here to talk about this idea of inferring. Look at verse 10 of chapter 10. This is Peter, the story of Cornelius, the Gentile. He will be brought in and the Gentiles will be brought into the church. This is how this whole story unfolds. In verse 10, Peter became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while he was preparing it, while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, <clears throat> for I've never eaten anything that is uncommon or unclean. And the voice came to him a second time saying, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. And you know, as a student of the Bible, what happens next? Peter goes to the Gentiles. But even when he goes to the Gentiles, he walks in and says, why did you call me? And it's going to be at the end of the chapter when the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles, that all of this starts coming together for Peter. Notice in verse 46, while they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God, then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptize, baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So I, I want to suggest to you that God was inferring a lot during this whole process. Or in fact, God was implying a lot. Why didn't God say, hey, Peter, it's time to bring the Gentiles in? He could have. But he didn't. What God does is he implies in this dream that it's time for the Gentiles to come in. Now, why did he do it? Why didn't, I don't know. But I, I am pointing out to you that that's what's going on here. There is an implication and Peter was to infer from this that the Gentiles were to be brought in. And he pulls it all together when the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Then he says, wait a minute, now I understand this whole thing. We can't deny baptism because this is the will of God. But God didn't tell them and there were no examples God implied. And Peter had to infer. Does that make sense? Everyone understand that? 
You see the process there? Because a lot of times people go, well, that whole inference thing, why doesn't God just tell us that? He doesn't directly tell us, how do you know? All I know is I have an example here of God operating just like that. There are going to be times God does not say directly, this is what I want. He says, there's the information. I want you to draw some conclusions from that. A couple of, um, of examples. Exodus chapter 20, the Israelites receiving the Ten Commandments. Honor the Sabbath. Which, which Sabbath? There are four or five every month. Okay, Which one? Which one? Well, they inferred from that that every week has a Sabbath. They honored God every Sabbath. And that's one of the reasons why we take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Yeah. Why? Well, Acts chapter 20, that's when they took the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. How many first days of the week are there every month? Four or five. Let's just take it every first day of the week. That seems to be the command. And by the way, I need it every first day of the week. How about <clears throat> when we think about our singing? Okay, again... We don't have a command, use an instrument of music. And I know a lot of people, I had a conversation recently with somebody, I think that's really nitpicky. Okay, you can think whatever you want. My only point is, I've got to operate from this book. And this is all I have. And my primary goal is to obey God. That's it, that's it. It's just God. It's not what I want to do, because David, he could have built a huge house for God. God's saying, I need to rein yourself in, David. I need you to just do what I say. It's not about what we think we can do for God. It's about what God wants and what I know God wants. And when it comes to singing, these are all passages you know. Ephesians 5, 19. Colossians 3, 17. Sing and make melody in your hearts to the Lord. I, there's not a command to use an instrument of music. I don't have an example in the New Testament and I can't infer it because that would mean it would have to be there and it's not there. We just sing. So why don't we just give God what he wants? Stick with that. Just, God, I, I, my only goal, well, I really want to play this piano. I really want to use this instrument, but I don't know if it pleases you, so I'm going to, I'm going to dial it back some. You and I have to ask ourselves, has God told me? Has God shown me? Has God inferred? And importantly, it's not just about what God has told us. It's what God has not told us sometimes too, because that's, that's God's argument here. When did I ever tell you? When did I ever tell you? So the whole argument, we sometimes say, well, God didn't say I can't do it. Well, David was sort of operating like that. God didn't say I couldn't build him a house. And God says, no, I, but I, I want you to operate under what I told you to do. So let's just stick with that. And this is the last point. We'll close the lesson after this. And that is, we joyfully submit. What does David do once God said, you know, David, I don't want a house from you. Your son is going to build it. And that's a whole layered issue there. But we won't go into that. But it's not for you to do. What if David said this? What if David said, mm, I'm going to build one anyway. What, what would we have thought of David? Would David be this hero of faith? The only reason David was the hero of faith is because he submitted. He had the means, he had the money, he had the desire, but he respected God and wanted to please God, and he limited himself. I'm never going to question the heart of anyone who engages in acts of worship that I think are inappropriate. I, I know that there are a lot of people out there meeting this morning who are engaged in, in practices that I don't believe the New Testament authorizes. I believe they are sincere. Okay? And I believe they probably want to serve the Lord. But what I see in this story is that ultimately it's not about what we want. It's about God. Well, let's just close with this. I want to give you a final illustration. The lesson will be yours. I think one of the fears that people have at this point is, but doesn't that, doesn't that undermine grace? Because now it's just about law, 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 and how do we know? And, and doesn't that take all the, all the grace out of the picture? Preachers 
are particularly concerned about and we struggle with the idea of law and grace because there is, there's a tension between the two. Grace is given to us precisely because we, we sometimes don't obey law. We were dead in our trespasses. And so a lot of Christians struggled with this. We don't need to be concerned about law and what God instructs. We just need to embrace grace more. And look, we're saved by grace and we don't undermine that. But they're not at odds with one another. And I want to suggest to you that my desire to obey him comes from his grace. And I understand that I'm saved by his grace, but that doesn't mean I don't seek to obey him the way he wants to be obeyed. So here's the illustration. Let's say Teresa and I are at the house one day and Teresa gets hurt. And let's say she's bleeding out. Okay, and I just, I get her in the car and I jump on in Louisville, the Water Descent Expressway. And the speed limit there is 60 miles an hour. And I'm going 70 miles an hour. I'm going 80 miles an hour. I'm, hit, I'm hitting 100. Okay. Did I break the law? Well, yeah. I mean, the law's fixed. Whether I'm caught or not. I broke the law. Let's say, give me just a minute. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up. What if, what if a cop pulls up behind me? Did I break the law? Yes, broke the law. Could he give me a ticket? Yes. What if though, what if the grace says, what if the cop says, you know what? I see what's happening. Get behind me. I'll get you to the hospital. Okay. Does that mean I didn't break the law? No, I still broke the law, but he's extending grace to me. Or maybe I go before the judge and the judge says, we'll throw it out. What that doesn't mean though it's because he extended grace. Next week when I'm on the Waterson Expressway, I go, well, law doesn't matter. That's it. I'll go as fast as I want to go. No, I still understand the law matters. But sometimes those who are administering the law or rather monitoring the law extend grace. And I'll just close with this. As Christians, we deeply appreciate grace. But I cannot discard what he tells me just because he gives grace. All right. I've got to be someone who's concerned about what pleases the Lord more than anything else. And in those areas where I fail, when I've striven to please him and I fail miserably before any of that happened, he extends grace, but he extends grace to you now. So grace and works are not at odds with each other. They don't undermine one another. I always rely upon God's grace. And that prompts me, and it should prompt you, to be someone who longs to follow him as best we can. All right? Whole point there. Living to please him. Thank you very much for your attention. God bless you. We'll see you in just a little while.